So our first uh, speaker this evening is Dr. Jen Ernst. Jen is a pediatric emergency physician and the trauma director at BC Children's Hospital. That's all I got on her bio, so I reached out to Hazel Park for a little more information. Uh, for those of you who know Hazel, she, with lots of exclamation marks, told me Jen is just an overall super awesome person. Uh, she loves to ski and hike, and apparently her aunt was the first female level four ski instructor in Canada. That was the random fact that I got from Hazel. So without further ado, Jen Ernst. I didn't know she knew that. Wow, that's amazing. And there's already snow in the mountains, so that's pretty great too. Um, thanks everyone for joining me today on this, this very not sunny, rainy afternoon with some snow in the Alpine. Um, I have nothing to disclose today. So what I want to talk about today are some tips and tricks I've picked up over the years um, managing our most acutely unwell and injured multi-system trauma patients. Um, I do want to talk a little bit as well about some of our treatment options and how they differ from the adult population, but also in ways that they're the same. I will review some diagnostic imaging modalities, some approaches to testing, and I'm going to focus mainly on blunt abdominal trauma for that. So why pediatric major trauma? Why have I decided to spend this much time thinking about peds major trauma? Well, it remains the number one cause of death and morbidity worldwide. And there are excellent things going on right now from our injury prevention specialists, but kids are still dying. We do see two age groups that are most affected. Little guys, the toddlers, when they start exploring, falling out of screens and windows, and our teens when they start misbehaving and doing risky behavior. Thankfully, in Canada, we still see a lot more blunt trauma than we do penetrating, but that may change. If you look at what's going on in the US right now, and even some of our events that we've had in Toronto or on the Danforth, this may change, and we need to be prepared for that. So be prepared. Obviously, any major trauma patient coming into the ED, it's a key part of pre-arrival preparedness is debriefing your team and getting prepared for that patient. But I think this especially holds true in kids, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. One of them being that kids often have multi-system trauma, especially head injuries. Um, family support is a big thing, and pre-assigning someone to the role of family support person, whether that be a social worker, uh, a nurse, a resident, or even a volunteer can make or break your resuscitation. Preparing medication equipment, as you all know, can be challenging, especially if you're only seeing four or five major trauma patients in kids a year. Remember, kids get cold, and they get cold fast, and so preparing a priori ways that you're going to warm your patient before they get there really, really can be key, and reduce that cognitive load when they do get there. So lots of ways to try to estimate a weight. And there's so many different rules out there. I think it's a little bit overwhelming. Sometimes there's a number of different equations, like age plus two times, you know, like two times weight, age. There's a whole bunch of different, um, different formulas that you can use, and some are better than others. There's the Braslow tape as well, which you guys have probably all seen, that has some limitations as well. And I don't know if you guys have noticed, looking at the Braslow tape, that the numbers on, on it are incredibly specific. For instance, it'll state things like 22 kilograms, for a child, who wants to calculate a drug doses based on 22 kilograms? Nobody, right? And so I'd advocate, yes, use the Braslow if that's what you're used to, but round down or up. It's not going to make or break your resuscitation. Interestingly, parent estimate of weight is incredibly accurate, but physician and healthcare provider estimates are not at all. So don't guess the weight by looking at the kid. And then there's a lot of resuscitation apps like Pedistat that you guys can use and can be very, very helpful. At the end of the day, one of the biggest things that makes a difference in an incoming trauma patient is simplifying your order sets or choosing one or two sedation or intubation drugs like ketamine and rocuronium and sticking to them, getting really, really good at them. So when you're calculating doses, it just reduces your cognitive load. And that's what we've done at BC Children's too, because we just don't see as many trauma patients as Dave Evans would see, right? And so anything we can do to try to make it easier on ourselves so we can focus on the family and the patient is key. One rule that you can use, and it's not a rule, it's a trick, um, is this 3-2-1 rule. And this is something we sometimes do to prepare for a severely injured patient. We drop these medications in 3-2-1 so that we have enough of the basic things to both intubate the patient by RSI and also potentially sedate them and have multiple doses of fentanyl ready to go or pre-medicate in TBI. Don't forget about intranasal medications. There's prime studies, pitchfork studies, lots of studies looking at fentanyl intranasal for extremity injuries and pain in kids, and it works great. 
And then nitrous oxide is something our paramedic colleagues use a ton to bring the kids over from the stretcher. Avoid propofol. Some people might have an issue with this, and we can talk about this in the question period. But propofol in kids has been shown to cause hypotension, and a hype, one hypotensive event is bad for brain outcome. Just a couple of transport considerations. Transferring to a pediatric trauma center for severely injured young patients and doing it quickly without secondary transfers can improve outcomes. Where there's some controversies are adolescents, right? And there's an increasing body, uh, body of evidence showing that adolescents can be managed quite well in mixed adult and pediatric trauma centers, so something to think about. Pediatric protocols for the community should include physiologic parameters. Remembering that 120 on 80 BP for a two-year-old is strikingly abnormal, and just keeping those type of things in mind. Um, Pre-hospital RSI by trained paramedics has been shown to improve outcomes. Where we've seen this the most and the greatest success is in Australia, where they've got a very, very robust pre-hospital care system. Um, but this is one of the places we can advocate for having more ITT, more acute care paramedics trained in critical airways in kids. And finally, CT imaging shouldn't delay transfer. There's a caveat to that, and that would be CT heads. Often you do have enough time in a neurocritical child to CT their heads before transfer, and that can really help us plan the OR and have neurosurgery ready to go when they arrive. Airway. So airway in kids is the second most common cause of injury-related death. And one of the reasons for this is sometimes we misdiagnose or we under-recognize how severely injured they are. A couple of years ago, we had a kid who was run over in um, the driveway of the house by the nanny a toddler, um, had tire tracks across the chest, and we were all anticipating a child coming in who was very, very sick. And she came in with her cute little blonde curls, waving at everybody, going, hi, and looked great. But she did have pretty significant pulmonary contusions, not a single rib fracture. So sometimes it can be really deceiving, and those kids need to be watched. Kids are prone to hypoxia. They have very small residual functional capacity, high minute ventilations, and they do get hypoxic fast. And lastly, small children breathe fast or crying or upset. They'll fill up their stomach with air, and it will impede their breathing. So putting an OG in early can make a big difference. I'll let you look at that for a second. So ATLS, most recently, um, has moved away for adults for needle decompression for tension pneumothoraces at the second intercostal space. Kids obviously have smaller chest walls. They don't tend to be as obese. They don't have as much musculature. And so they've kept the second intercostal space in kids for tension pneumothoraces. What I'd advocate for, here, for this here is do what you're most comfortable with. There is nothing wrong if you're more comfortable doing a finger thoracosynthesis, do it. If you're more comfortable needling a child at the fifth intercostal space, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. It just means that the second intercostal space still works in kids. You have more options. We are moving towards smaller and smaller chest strains, just like the adult world for pneumothoraces, and using a lot of pigtails, especially for isolated pneumothoraces. So Sarah is bleeding. I want you just to consider this case for a couple of minutes and a couple of questions that result from this. So this is a five-year-old pedestrian struck, thrown really, really far, very tachycardic, signs of poor perfusion. You know she's arriving, you don't have a blood pressure yet. Just take a second to think about what are the causes of shock potentially in this child? What are the causes of just tachycardia alone? And what are potential sources of bleeding in this five-year-old? And how would that differ from adults? So namely here, age is important. Children who are prepubertal don't bleed in the same places as adults do, and it's something that's really important to consider. So adults, uh, teenagers, effectively, and I'm going to say this, a lot of my colleagues will find this controversial, but adolescents are essentially small, healthy adults. And so they bleed into their pelvis, they bleed into their long bones, they're very physiological, physiologically similar to adults. Small children are not. So small children don't bleed into their pelvis, or it's not the sole source of bleeding. They tend not to bleed into their long bones, but they can bleed an incredible amount into their head and scalp. And we've even seen, we had a small child a while back, under a year old, who fell off a changing table, had a massive epidural, and their hemoglobin was 78. They had no other injuries. They bled about a quarter to a third of their blood volume into their head, and that can happen. And I think once you've thought about what potential sources of bleeding there are, you need to think about what's your fluid management, and really the what, when you're going to give it, and how much. <laughs> 
And so as you know from your adult experience and from your pediatric experience, we are moving towards a more restrictive crystalloid strategy. And this holds true for kids, and I think we're a little bit behind the adult literature in children, where we're still giving 40 to 60 mils per kilo of crystalloids to kids, hoping to not have to give them a blood transfusion. And we're probably not doing them any good by doing that. That said, one bolus in a healthy, non-coagulopathic child with a solid organ injury, often we give them one bolus of crystalloids and they stop bleeding entirely. They've got an excellent ability to clot and they've got encapsulated solid organs. So what does ATLS say? So the most recent version in 2008 says one bolus of so 20 mils per kilo of isotonic fluid and then weight-based blood products. And just keeping in mind that at the end of the day, if you're in a center that cannot provide this child with definitive care, your main priority is an initial resuscitation and transferring them out. This is the approach that I advocate for. So there's two types of patients that we see in pediatric trauma. One of them is the comp compensated shock patient. This is the patient who might have some signs of poor perfusion, delayed cap refill, a bit tachypneic and tachycardic. And that's the patient I'd advocate for trying a bolus of saline first. A proportion of those patients will be responders and get better. If not, you can give them blood. That said, the child who's hypotensive, remember a pediatric patient that's hypotensive has likely lost up to 40 milliliters per kilo of blood. That's half their circulating volume. At that point, if you have blood available, by all means, give it and then move on to an MTP, just the way you would in a bleeding adult patient. So what's the definition of massive hemorrhage? We didn't have an answer to this until a couple of years ago, um, but large uh, database studies in the US have shown us that children tend to have higher mortality and morbidity after about 40 mils per kilo of blood products after the first couple of hours, which is now our definition at BC Children's for a massive transfusion, is anticipated needs of more than 40 mils per kilo of blood. Is there any evidence for a specific foundation ratio in kids? Absolutely not. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of practice variation. We at BC Children's do one to one to one of plate, platelets, plasma, and blood, but you'll see some practice variation across the country. Impact of MTPs, because we don't have the numbers, is unclear, especially when it comes to outcomes like mortality, but we do know it decreases cognitive load and it expedites blood product delivery, and that in and of itself is worthwhile. Tranexamic acid, the age-old debate for kids widely adopted in adults, though now we're starting to see some literature that's going back on that, but for another day. But in 2019, as it stands, in pediatric trauma across Canada and the US, TXA is not standard of care. And if you look at the BC Children's Massive Transfusion Protocol, because of some disagreements among our team, it says consider TXA. Why do it? Is it safe? So we use TXA in huge doses in pediatric trauma. So the safety profile has thought up until recently to be quite good. Um, however, recent studies in Japan looking at like 62,000 patients showed a small, tiny increase in seizure activity. So something to think about when you're giving TXA to an isolated head trauma, which you wouldn't in adults necessarily either. Some kids with solid organ injuries, like I said, they get one bolus of crystalloids and they're fine. Did they really need TXA? Maybe, maybe not. So what's the approach here? And what's the take home message? Adolescents, again, small, healthy adults apply adult criteria. And bleeding with severe shock for all ages, there's definitely a plausible benefit there. And what you're gonna see with the new guidelines from BCHS, the kids who are tachycardic and hypotensive with bleeding will get TXA in the field. So how? This is a big question and a very difficult question in pediatrics. How does one give blood? Um, Kids get hypothermic really fast and very coagulopathic, and it's important to warm these fluids. Many centers have a level one or rapid infuser. Some centers don't. Keep in mind that the second you have an IV that is smaller than an 18 gauge, you are no longer using your rapid infuser as a rapid infuser. You're by no means delivering a liter or 600 mils of fluid per minute. You're doing that much, much slower. You need at least an 18 gauge catheter, which is not always possible in a two-year-old, right? But it'll still warm your fluid. There's hotlines for smaller volumes. And one thing you can do in small babies that's been shown to be very effective is taking syringes, filling them with either crystalloids or bloods, putting them under a radiant warmer or under the bear hugger, allowing them to warm up and pushing them. And the concern with this before was a risk of hemolysis. And it's been shown time and time again, outside of the first week of life, there's no real risk of hemolysis. And it's easy. And you don't need a level one infuser. Torso trauma. Um, an important 
issue in pediatric patients because it's often a fatal, unrecognized source of bleeding in kids. Um, but a lot of our kids actually don't have significant torso trauma, so it's hard. Um, mechanism predicts head injuries. It's good at predicting MSK injuries. It's terrible at predicting torso, so chest and abdominal injuries. And that's where it becomes really difficult to approach these kids clinically and decide what to do. So most of our kids don't require surgical interventions. We mainly do neurocritical or neurosurgical interventions in kids urgently rather than laparotomies. Um, hollow viscous is the one exception to that. And there's a lot of clinical decision roles that are out there to help you risk stratify for intra-abdominal injury. So I want you to think for a minute about these two kids. They are riding together along to school on their bicycles, brother and sister. One's an 11-year-old girl, and she's struck by the SUV, going quite fast, thrown, no helmet, has a GCS of six. She's intubated on field, in the field. She's tachycardic. She's not yet hypotensive. She's requiring some O2, and she seems to be bleeding quite a bit from her head. Her brother was nicked by the car and fell off his bike. He's talking to you, he's smiling at you, and he's sitting up in the trauma bay and was ambulating at scene. What I want you to think about is how your approach would differ between these two. And these are really the two extremes of kids that we see. And we can't say that our approach to these two patients would be the same. Their pretest probability of blunt abdominal trauma is completely different. And so the approach that I would advocate for is this one. Look at these kids differently. Although there's no single one laboratory test like transaminitis or a FAST or a chest x-ray that can tell you whether or not this kid has a solid organ injury or intra-abdominal injury, in these high-risk patients, any of these factors should prompt you to do a CT scan of their abdomen. They're high-risk patients. This is an intubated patient. You're not going to get a good clinical exam. And reserve some of these clinical decision rules, like the PCARN rules, to our low-risk intra-abdominal injury kits. And just to give you a bit of background on the PCARN rules, essentially, in a nutshell, if a child has no signs of trauma on their chest or abdomen on clinical exam, have normal vital signs, and are breathing normally, the negative predictive value of that exam is 99.9% .9 for an intra-abdominal injury requiring intervention. Hence, they don't need to be CT'd. They can be watched, you can do serial fast, you can keep them in the ED for four to six hours, but they don't need unnecessary radiation. So FAST, another controversial topic in pediatric trauma. And I would divide our approach to FAST and blunt trauma very similarly. Um, for anyone who works a lot with children, for a long time, what we hoped ultrasound would achieve was negate our need for CT scanning and remove all ionizing radiation from children. I don't think that was entirely a realistic goal. Um, and so a lot of the studies, including recent ones in JAMA, are very much focused on these low-risk patients. And what's being shown is that FAST doesn't really give you any more information than your physical exam and takes time. And hence, there's no real value added. It also may miss injuries, like we talked about. Spleens in kids are very well encapsulated. They can bleed a lot into that capsule, or you could have a high-grade splenic injury without a lot of intra-abdominal free fluid, and you might miss it. And there may, however, in these kids be a role for serial exam and something to keep in mind. Now, a hemodynamically compromised child who's hypotensive, if you do a fast of their abdomen and it's completely normal, I would suggest you look for another source of bleeding. And I think that's a very important point there, is that you know, once you've bled half your blood volume into your belly, you should have a positive fast. And if you don't, you need to look elsewhere. And we also are, have been a little bit slow on the uptake in terms of the extended fast and looking at the chest, looking at the heart. And that's an important role for this test, too. So my favorite slide of the day. So if you take anything home from this talk is that kids have traumatic brain injuries until proven otherwise. Why is that? Just look at the size of Stewie's head. Every, the way they fall, if they fall off a balcony, they're going head first. If they fall and get thrown off their bike, they're hitting the back of their head first. So even your abdominal traumas or your cyclist injuries have a risk of having TBI. And TBI is the number one killer of kids. And like we said, the number one reason they need neurosurgical interventions. The goal in children is the same as in adults, and that's rapid physiological resuscitation. Keeping in mind, you need to have a certain understanding of what their physiology is and what their normal parameters are. And that's why it's important to keep that in your mind. And you know, one of the things sometimes we see missed is that their, heart, their BP in the toddler is 120 on 80, and everyone's that's normal, that's normal, that's great. Their heart rate's now 80. Now they're actually hypertensive and bradycardic, so just keeping that in mind. 
Is there any good evidence for what we do in TBI? No. We don't have the numbers. There's a huge amount of practice variation in the way that we manage moderate to severe TBI, and it's really unfortunate. And what it means is that we basically have no RCTs and can't do systematic reviews, which is really painful. And if you actually look, if I can do this, um, the only thing that has any evidence is hypertonic saline, so 3% hypertonic saline. So do that. Everything else, therapeutic hypothermia, don't do it. Steroids, don't do it. But everything else we do doesn't have a lot of evidence. Frustrating. However, how do we improve TBI care? And there are things we can do. Rapid, goal-directed care to maintain a normal physiology is really, really key and has been shown to improve outcomes. Judicious use of fluids, giving 60, 80 mils per kilo of crystalloids will in increase cerebral edema and worsen outcomes. The most important, arguably, is time considerations. And this is a huge challenge in a province like BC that's massive and huge, and where, where we only have neurosurgeons down in the mainland of Vancouver. Um, but if we can find ways to shorten that interval between CT and surgical intervention, we have the potential to really improve our TBI care. And at the end of the day, if we all adhere to guidelines, we can not only improve care, but we can also study what works and doesn't. I put this up here not so that you read any of the details, but the counterargument to this or the silver lining to all of this is that kids do way better than adults. Um, even children who have fixed dilated pupils when they present to the emergency room have GCSs of three do exceedingly well and way better than adults. And up to 70% of them will go home and live very happy and productive lives. And keep that in mind and try to fight that urge to be, wow, this resuscitation is futile because it's likely not. Unfortunately, in our younger patients with traumatic brain injury, um, a large proportion of them, especially if the mechanism was unwitnessed, do have inflicted trauma or non-accidental injury. So just keeping a high index of suspicion is really important. Spinal motion restriction. I know you've had other opportunities in this conference to discuss this as well, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what this looks like for our younger pediatric population, because this can be quite challenging. So here you've got a three-year-old girl. She fell from a fourth floor window. She arrives from scene from EMS. She's screaming, she's thrashing, she's trying to climb onto the lights in the trauma bay, and she's calling for her mom. Um, she has no C-spine precautions in place because BCEHS deemed that that wasn't appropriate. What are your thoughts on that? Should you forcibly restrain her? Should you sedate her heavily so you can image her C-spine? Um, and I think these are important considerations. And I must say 10 years ago, we might have with a four-story fall like that. And the evidence isn't really that there to support that that's the case. What happens with pediatric patients when they fall and they hurt their spine is that they tend to guard their necks. This is not a football player who comes in and wants to push through the pain. A three, four-year-old will just, just sit like this or have torticollis and not want to move. And so kids under five tend to clinically clear themselves. And I've told this story to some of you before, but um, our trauma manager is from Vancouver General, and uh, her first experience in the BC Children's Trauma Bay was with a very similar kid, and we spent about 20 minutes of our resuscitation singing wheels on the bus to this kid to see if he'd move his neck or not. We never forcibly restrained him. We sang wheels on the bus. She was like, wow, I'm going back to VGH. But we actually kept her, so that was great. Um, but try to settle them. Try to get the caregiver involved. Don't forcibly restrain them. They could do a lot of harm. And as we know, C-spine collars aren't that great at actually achieving spinal motion restriction. And so my take-home messages for today, first of all, be prepared. Simplify what you do. Round up or down numbers so that they're easy to calculate and have everything ready to go before they get there. Um, judicious use of crystalloids, we're behind the adult trauma centers. We can do better, we can give less fluids, and kids are going to do better if we do that. Now, clinical decisions regarding blunt abdominal trauma are really hard. Um, there are CPGs out there to make decisions about it as well. Um, but think of your Think of your population of pediatric patients in those two categories, and it will help you decide what clinical elements to incorporate in your decision making. Do not forcibly restrain children. You're going to do harm. And TBI until proven otherwise. Thank you very much.